Hello students, this is Mr. DeMath with another physics lesson. This lesson is actually a recap about the Scrum project that we did the last few lessons. This is to prepare yourself for the upcoming quiz that will be done uh, probably next lesson. Well, what you need to know uh, to start with is that everything around you is actually made out of uh, really tiny particles. If you, you, for instance, take your skin and you start zooming in on your skin, you will find molecules at a certain moment. And molecules are just the building blocks of everything around you. So your skin, but also the building uh, you're uh, sitting in right now, uh, your computer, everything around you is actually made out of molecules. If you zoom in into those molecules, you will find atoms. Those are even smaller. But if you start zooming in on those atoms, you will find very, very small particles. Well, to start with, we have the protons. And the protons are, um, there are a few uh, properties of protons that you should remember. First of all, it has a positive electrical charge. So the charge is always uh, uh, referred as plus one. I also show you over here the mass of a proton and you see it's multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 27. So you should know that this is extremely small. Yeah. Well, all the protons have a positively charged, uh, uh, they are positively charged, and that's the main thing that you should remember. I'm not going to ask you what is the mass of a proton. This is just to show you how small they are actually are. Well, the protons, uh, and next to the protons you have the neutrons. And the neutrons are almost the same mass, you see that over here. And the main difference is they don't have any charge. So they are not charged with plus one or they are not charged with minus one. They just don't have any charge. I always tell my students it's like this. The neutrons are like the glue for the protons. But you can maybe some of you already know that plus and plus, well, they don't attract each other. They repel each other. So you need some kind of a glue to get this all stuck together. It needs to be stuck together because that is actually the core of an atom. And you see what I've already uh, uh, show you over here is you see that the electrons, they are negatively charged and they fly around actually the core of this atom. So in the core of the atom, you'll find the neutrons and the protons and around the core, you will find the electrons. And you see the electrons, they don't have a fixed position. They are actually moving constantly around the core of that atom. Well, in this situation, I used a, a core with three positive protons. You see that over here. And I have three negative electrons. Every atom wants to be neutral. Yeah, so if you have four uh, protons, you're going to get four electrons. If you have a core with, let's say, 20 protons, then you will probably have uh, 20 electrons flying around it because every atom wants to be neutral. Okay, let's see how it works with positive and negatively charged particles. Well, this is the first question. I have three situations. And this is, the question is like this. Particles repel or attract other particles depending on their charge. In which situations do the charges repel? And question B, in which situations do the, charge, uh, do the charges attract? So please stop the video and try to answer this question yourself. Well, what you should remember is this. Like charge, uh, charges, uh, they always repel each other. Maybe you know, uh, you've played with magnets before. A uh, magnet is not the same as electrical charge, but just to give you an idea. If you take two magnets, a magnet has a positive pole and a negative pole. We say the north and the south pole. Yeah, a North Pole is not attracted to another North Pole. Maybe you've do done that experiment yourself with two magnets. If you hold them close together with the North Poles facing each other, well, then they repel. Yeah, if you turn them around, or one, you turn one around, then you have a North Pole that is attracted to a South Pole, and they actually uh, attract each other. Well, that is exactly the same with charged particles. Charged particles, negative particles, uh, well, they don't like each other, so, well, they fly away. And with the positive particles, it's exactly the same. Positive and positive, they don't like each other, so they repel. Yeah? 
The opposite is true with a negative and a positive particle. They really like each other and they come to watch each other. Yeah, so they attract each other. Well, and in this situation, you immediately see the difference between uh, an electron and a proton. A proton, the mass of a proton, is much bigger than the mass of an electron. That means that the electron will move much quicker towards the positive uh, proton than the proton moving towards the negative electron. Okay, that was question number one. Let's continue. Question number two, I have uh, three situations over here and uh, you see there are uh, three different atoms given. The question is this, determine the charge of each atom. So again, stop the video and please start uh, giving answer to this question. Well, if you want to know if an atom is uh, charged, you need to look at the different uh, particles. You always start with the particles in the core and you start counting them. It's no use of counting the, the neutrons because neutrons, they don't have any charge. Yeah, so only focus on the protons. Well, you see in each situation, I have three protons. So uh, in situation number one, the charge is plus three over here in the core, but I also have three electrons and that means negative three. So I have plus three over here, negative three on the outside, plus three minus three means there is no charge. In the second situation, you still have those three protons over here, but you have two electrons over there. So we have plus three and we have minus two. That means that this atom is going to be positively charged plus one. The last situation, again, three protons, so plus three, and we have five electrons. That means minus five. Plus three minus five means minus two. So it's a negatively charged atom. Okay, what is electricity? Well, let's talk about that. Uh, this is a cross section uh, over a wire. So yeah, I have the top of the wire over here and the bottom of the wire over there. Well, the wire itself, of course, is made out of atoms. Yeah, so if you take a copper wire, the wire is made out of copper atoms. Yeah, if you take a, a steel wire, then these atoms are steel atoms. Yeah, and so on. I already told you that in the beginning, every atom wants to be neutral. So the same amount of protons as you have the same amount of electrons over there. But with materials that uh, are very good in uh, transporting electricity, you have a lot of free atoms. And free atoms are just atoms that, well, they can fly through that uh, material, for instance, and they, well, they see another atom. Well, they are attracted, of course, by that positive proton here in the core. So this, uh, uh, this uh, electron will just fly towards this um, atom and will, well, get absorbed by that atom. And at that moment, the atom is negatively charged. Well, the atom doesn't want to be negatively charged, it wants to be neutral. So what it will do, it will kick out one of the atoms and the atom will fly to the next atom. Sorry, the, the, the electron will fly to the next atom and you already know what is going to happen. This one was neutral, it will be become negatively charged and this one will become neutral again. The same situation, this atom uh, doesn't want to be negatively charged so it will push one of the electrons away to the other atom. And you see that happening over here. So what you need to remember is this. Electricity is actually the flow of charge. Yeah, so it's the flow of charge and in this case it's the flow of electrons, of course. Well, if you look at those electrons, uh, there are two things that you need to remember about the electrons. Let me start with the charge. Yeah, the charge of each electron is minus one. It always stays minus one. It will never change. It won't lose its charge. So the charge of an electron is always minus one. It starts at minus one and it ends at minus one in a circuit. Always the charge stays the charge. So electricity was the flow of charge. And if you connect an amp meter, and in this case I used a multimeter, a multimeter is just a tool uh, with which you can 
measure all kinds of things. If you put it on amps, you can actually measure the amount of current flowing through your system. So all the electrons flow to this amp meter and it gives you a certain value, in this case 2.0 amps. Yeah. So what is actually the current? The current is the amount of charge per second. Yeah, so the, this tool will only measure the amount of electrons flowing by at, well, uh, per second. That is the current. So the current is a quantity that we can study. And it starts, of course, with a symbol. It's a capital I and the unit is the capital A from Ampere. So remember this one, please, for the test. This is a very important one. Well, if we look at uh, that wire again, I already told you there are two important things about electrons. First of all, it's the charge, and the charge is something that's not going to change. But there is another thing, and that thing will change. And that is the amount of energy that is actually captured in one of those electrons. If you, for instance, uh, plug in your phone, and the phone is getting charged, what you need to know is this phone needs energy to function. Yeah, and the electrons are actually the transport of energy. So what they will do is they will bring energy to this device, it's converted into another type of energy, and then the electrons flow on. But that means that a bit of the energy is used, and you see that over here. So a bit of the energy before uh, the phone is actually well used by the phone. Yeah, that's what you see over here. So a bit of the energy is actually used by the phone. So the charge is not going to change. The only thing that will change is the amount of energy in the electron. Well, if it flows back to the battery, then the battery charges the electron again, completely full, and then the electron will flow to this wire again and well, comes past the, the phone and will leave a bit of energy at the phone. That's the idea. So there is a difference between, and you call that the energy difference over here, delta E, the energy difference is actually the difference between the situation on this side and the situation on that side. So the energy difference is also something that you call the energy conversion. Because a bit of the electrical energy stored in the electrons is actually converted in, well, it can be all kinds of uh, energies, and in this uh, case, for instance, light energy, because the display, of course, lights up. Sound energy, uh, it can vibrate, so you also have kinetic energy. But there are probably more types of energy that you can think of. Well, this next question. A lamp is connected to a circuit. So this is the symbol for a lamp, and you already see what's happening. You have charged electrons over here. They leave a bit of energy over here at the lamp and they continue. Again, the charge is not going to change. The only thing that changes is the amount of energy. So question A, which uh, energy conversion takes place in a lamp? And B, which of the energy types after the conversion can be labeled as waste energy? So please stop the movie for a minute and I will be back shortly. Well, the energy conversion that takes place in a lamp is, of course, from electrical energy to light energy. That is the main focus. The only problem with the old school lamps is that most of the electrical energy is actually converted in waste energy in the form of heat. Yeah, that's why it's better to use, for instance, LED uh, lights, because most of the electrical energy going in an LED will be converted in, well, the, uh, the desired uh, type of energy, namely light energy, yeah? So heat energy is most of the times waste energy. You don't want to have heat energy. Well, here's an overview of, uh, well, actually most types of energy that we know. Well, we've got mechanical energy, and you see kinetic energy is part of that. Kinetic energy is uh, movement. Yeah, uh, you have sound energy. Well, in sound energy, you know that sound travels in waves, so it has to do with waves. Uh, for instance, chemical energy, uh, you all do chemistry, and you know that uh, with a reaction, well, energy can be, um, well, can, can be released and can be used, for instance, 
So that's over here. Um, we've got electrical energy. Well, you all know lightning. Lightning is actually a form of electrical energy and you're using electrical energy, well, actually the whole day. Um, well, electrical energy is everywhere present. We've got light energy in the form of radiation, uh, the visible light, but also the invisible light uh, that is not visible for humans, uh, where we may have, which we use for X-rays, for instance. Uh, that is all light energy. We've got heat energy. Again, heat energy. Most of the time, heat energy is uh, a waste. But for instance, if you're using this, well, you want to have uh, it heated. And for instance, cold coffee is not the way you drink coffee normally. So heat is something that you can also use. Then we've got nuclear energy. Well, nuclear energy is, of course, used in nuclear bombs or in uh, big factories like this. Um, where they actually create electrical energy from nuclear energy. So that are the types of energy that we know. Well, let's have a little question about that. Uh, over here you see uh, five different uh, well, uh, items. And the question is this, which energy conversion takes place in each situation? And I already gave you an example. Uh, for instance, you put in electricity in this light bulb over here, you will get light and a waste product, you get heat as well. So please stop the movie for a minute and just fill this in. Okay, the first one, the first one, well, uh, this is of course a speaker and a speaker creates of course a sound, but the energy type that enters the speaker is of course a signal and the signal is, an, is electricity. Yeah, so the signal is sent from your, um, uh, from your uh, phone, for instance, towards the speaker, and it's converted into sound energy. Well, you won't get sound energy immediately. For sound energy, something needs to vibrate, and that's why you have this cone over here. The cone starts vibrating, and vibrating is, of course, a form of movement, so that's why we call it kinetic energy. The second one. In the second one, well, of course, you start with wind energy. Yeah. And the wind energy is actually converted in electricity. The fourth one is uh, a motor that is in, uh, inside of your car. And, uh, well, you go to the gas station to get fuel, of course. So fuel is actually made out of all kinds of particles. And, well, when there is a reaction, the energy is released. So we call that chemical energy. And the chemical energy can be converted in all kinds of types uh, of the main type is, of course, kinetic energy because you want your car to start moving, but also to heat it up, to switch on the lights or to switch on the sound. Okay, and the fifth one is a resistor. A resistor, the only thing that a resistor does, it, it converts electrical energy into heat energy. You use a resistor, for instance, in front of a lamp because you don't want to have a huge amount of current flowing through your lamp because then your lamp will break. So you place a resistor in front of it. Well, and the resistor, well, actually a whole, uh, converts a bit of energy into heat energy. So the energy is not going to be in the light bulb. It's already released in the form of heat. Okay. Well, energy conversion uh, always takes place when you do something with the electrical energy. And in a resistor, for instance, uh, in a resistor, this is going to happen. So you have the normal wire. And in a resistor, the wire is just reduced in, uh, in uh, surface area. It just makes it uh, much smaller. If you compare it to a tube of water, for instance, if you uh, uh, squeeze the tube of water, then less water will flow through that tube per second. And that's the same with a resistor, only then with electrical energy in the form of electrons. So when you do something like that, you will produce a lot of heat. So the energy, the electrical energy inside the electrons is actually converted into heat. So that is the energy conversion that takes place in a resistor. Well, another thing that we should talk about is the potential difference. Um, like you just saw over here, those electrons won't start flowing just by doing nothing. You need to push the electrons to the wires. And you need something that pushes the electrons to the wire, and that is called a battery or a power source. And the power source actually pushes the electrons to a wire. So 
if the potential difference of a battery is high, then the force on those uh, electrons will be high as well, and you get a really big current. Yeah. If the potential difference is small, then you won't get a really big current. Well, the potential difference is something that you can measure, and it's already in the word difference. Difference means you measure it at two points. So if you place a multimeter and you switch it on to volt, you can measure the potential difference between two points. So you measure, for instance, the value over here, and you measure the value over there, and the difference of those two values is given on this voltmeter. So what is the definition of potential difference? Potential difference is actually, well, it, it consists out of two definitions. The first one is this one. It's the energy difference between two points. You already see that in this drawing. The amount of energy in these electrons is, well, 100%. And over here, you only have 20% left. So the difference in energy is actually the potential difference. So a bit of the energy is used, and that is this amount, and that is, well, given on this display. Yeah? You can also think about the potential difference as the force that pushes the electrons to the circuit. So without that force, nothing is going to move. And the potential difference is, of course, created by a battery. And um, I will go to that battery later on. And the battery actually... Well, creates that force by having a positive and a negative pole. Because all the electrons want to go to the positive pole, of course. So that is actually the force that is created by the battery. Okay, a potential difference, PD, is something that we can study. It's a quantity. And I also wrote, wrote down the different names of potential difference. And that could be helpful for you, because sometimes we talk about EMF, that is the electromotive force, or we talk about the voltage drop. That's all the same. So it's all the potential difference. So sometimes you hear EMF, you immediately need to know they are talking about the potential difference. Well, the symbol for potential difference is a capital U, and the unit to measure the potential difference is volt, capital V. Yeah, so the potential difference, the symbol for it is a capital U, and the unit is a capital V. Now, potential difference is something that a lot of students find pretty difficult. Um, and uh, I always make the comparison with uh, water. And you see that over here, I have uh, two cylinders of water over here and over here, and they are uh, connected with this tube over here. And there is a slide in the middle. Well, you see there's more water over here than there is water over here. Yeah. If I now take the slide out of it, you see that the water will flow to this tube, to this cylinder. Yeah. Up to the moment that there is an equilibrium and that the level in both cylinders is the same. Yeah. At that moment, there is no flow of water anymore. But just before you release the slide, uh, take out the slide over here, well, there is an enormous pressure of water over here on this tube. Yeah? The pressure on this side is just way less. Yeah? Because there is just less water. In this situation, the pressure over here is almost the same as the pressure over here. If those levels are exactly the same, there is no pressure and there is no flow of water anymore. Well, that pressure is called the potential difference. So if you connect, well, you can't do that, of course, with water, but if you would be able to connect the difference between this cylinder and this cylinder, you're actually measuring the potential difference. And the potential difference in this case is very high, yeah, because there is a main difference in the amount of water. Well, in the, in the, on the right side, if you measure the potential difference on that side, well, you talk about a low potential difference because there isn't a big difference between the water levels. So the flow of those uh, water molecules over here won't be very big. If you take out the slide over here, at the beginning, the, um, the flow of the water will be huge, the speed of it. Yeah? Because there is a lot of pressure on it. So that tells you a bit about what potential difference is. And you can actually... Um, Copy this on top of a, a battery. 
So a battery always has one side, you call that the positive side, and you have one side that you call the negative side. And there's always something in the middle. And that is actually the thing that causes the difference. Yeah, so there is a difference on one side and there is a difference on the other side. And because of the dis di uh, difference, if you connect a wire on this uh, side and a lamp and then go back to this side, you're actually establishing a closed circuit and a closed circuit with a potential difference. So that's why the electrons start flowing. Okay, there is a difference in the type of battery that you can use. And uh, I have a range over here with names uh, uh, to it. And you also see they are slightly different. So some are uh, small, some are a bit taller, some are bigger uh, than this one. So you'll get all types of batteries. Well, the main thing that you need to know about batteries is each battery has a potential difference. And that is given. So in this case, this one is 1.5 volt. Most batteries that you use in your life will be 1.5 volt. The same as this one, also 1.5 volt. So the difference between this side and that side of the battery is 1.5 volt. Yeah. Uh, to this battery, the potential difference is 1.2 volt. And the potential difference in this case is 9.0 volt. So you see, different batteries have different uh, potential difference. They can also be the same, but there is a difference between those two batteries. Well, and that's the next question. Oh, that's something that you need to remember. The higher the potential difference, you will get a higher current with the same potential difference. Uh, sorry, higher potential difference, higher current if you use the same resistor. Okay, the first question. Uh, both the Mignon AA and the Baby C battery have a potential difference of 1.5 volts. Which of the two stores the most energy? So please stop the movie and finish this question, please. Well, this question, uh, maybe you, you notice that uh, the two batteries are not the same in size. And with batteries, size matters. Yeah? So the bigger the battery, the longer it will last. Yeah, if you compare it uh, with the same, if they have the same potential difference. Yeah, if they have the same potential difference, you're going to look at the size of the battery. And yeah, the, the size of uh, type C is, of course, bigger than the, the size of this one. That means it can store more electrons. And those electrons will, of course, be filled with energy. So, um, I already showed you this picture, and it was about um, electricity and how electrons actually move from atom to atom. And the current was the amount of charge per second yeah, that passes at a certain point. So, you can measure it over here, or you can measure it over there, and you measure the total current. Well, I told you that it starts with those free electrons, yeah? If you have a free electron, that free electron can move well uh, through the wire by jumping from one atom to another atom. If you have more free atoms, yeah, like this one, well, there will be a bigger current because there are just more electrons flowing through that wire. So it depends on the material that you're using. So if the material that you're using has a lot of free electrons, you can get a really big current, and that means you have a really good conductor. Yeah, it conducts electricity very good. Well, here is the periodic system, and in the periodic system you see all those atoms, and the atoms are of course built of protons, but also of electrons flying around it. So, you have different materials. The different materials mean you have a different amount of free electrons, and the more electrons you have, the better it conducts electricity. Less el free electrons means you get an insulator. So, the difference between an insulator and a conductor is the amount of electrons. Now, please stop the, uh, the movie and try to finish this, these questions. Fill in the missing words. Okay, let's look at the questions. Insulators. They have... Well, a few free electrons, that's the idea. They don't have enough electrons 
uh, well, actually to conduct electricity in a good way. So they are bad conductors, but they are good resistors. Examples are plastic, glass, or cotton, for instance. Well, conductors, they have a lot of free electrons. And that's why they are good conductors, but they are bad resistors. Okay, if you need to start drawing circuits, uh, I want you to remember a few symbols that we use a lot. And I will go through all those symbols, and I recommend you to copy those symbols in your own notebook. First of all, drawing a wire is pretty easy. That's just a line. Yeah, so the wire is represented by a line. A lamp always looks like this. And this is just an old lamp that we used in the... Uh, that heet een gloeilamp in het Nederlands. That is not the same as an LED. Yeah? So, it is always a circle with a cross in it. That represents a lamp. A battery, the symbol for a battery looks like this. So you have a piece that is a bit longer and a piece that is a bit smaller. The piece that is a bit smaller, we call that the minus part, uh, side of the battery. There is also another symbol for an energy supply and that is, well, not used uh, often, so we won't use this one in the test probably. Focus on the battery. Well, a closed switch always looks like this, and an open switch will look like this. You see, it's actually open. Well, then we have an amp meter. You can measure the current with an amp meter, and an amp meter is always part of the circuit, so that's why I drew it like this. It's part of the circuit, so it needs to be in the wire. Yeah. The voltmeter is something that you measure the potential difference with, and the potential difference is measured over two points. That's why I drew it like this. You connect it over here, and you connect it over there, and you measure the difference between those two points. Well, the standard symbol for a resistor looks like this. So it's just a rectangle in the wire, and a beeper is just something that makes a sound, and it's symbolized like this. Okay, so you should be able to draw electrical circuits now. Let's draw the first one. Draw a circuit with the following elements. A battery, a switch, two lamps, an amp meter, a voltmeter over a lamp. So stop the movie and start drawing this in your notebook. Okay, to start with, always start with a closed circuit. So just draw a rectangle and then you start drawing all the pieces that you need to draw into it. First of all, you start with a battery. Here's my battery. Next thing that I added is a switch. It doesn't matter if you place a switch over here, or you place it over here, or you place it over there. It's all the same. Now you place those two lamps. Uh, you can even place the switch in between the lamps. It will function exactly the same. If the switch is set on open, there is no closed circuit, and there won't be a flow of electrons. So the light bulbs won't shine. Now you need to place the amp meter. Well, the amp meter always needs to be part of the circuit, so make sure you place it, well, actually in a wire like this. You could also place it over here, you can place it over here, over here, uh, just next to the battery. It's also allowed, you will measure the current everywhere in this system. Well, now you need to measure the uh, potential difference over a lamp. Well, you need to measure over one of those lamps, so, I placed it over here. Well, I already wrote it down. An amp meter is always placed in the circuit, and a voltmeter is placed over the circuit, and we call that parallel. Okay, next question. Search for a new position of the amp meter in such a way that the value given on the amp meter doesn't change. Well, I already gave you the answer over here. It doesn't matter where you place the amp meter. The amp meter can be placed everywhere in this circuit because you will measure the same current flowing from the positive pole to the negative pole. Yeah. Well, put the movie on, uh, uh, on pause and make questions C and D yourself. Okay. Will the current flow through the voltmeter? Well, take a good look how it works with the current. The current, of course, starts at the positive pole and flows over here, and it reaches the amp meter. Well, what you need to know is that the resistance of this amp meter is extremely small. 
Yeah, there's almost no resistance. So the electrons will just flow through this wire. Yeah. Then at this point, the electrons can choose. They can choose to go through the lamp or they can choose to go through the voltmeter. Well, how do they pick their route? Well, that depends on the amount of resistance. If the resistance is very big, the electrons don't like to go to that path. They want to go to the, a path that has the le uh, less resistance. So in this case, well, a voltmeter is always made with a really high resistor. Yeah. So the electrons, if they need to pick this route, it's going to be very difficult for them because they can't pass over here. So they won't take this route. They will take, or they pick the route with less resistance. Well, there is resistance in a lamp, but it's much smaller than the resistance of a voltmeter. And that's why the electrons will just flow to this wire. Well, and of course, the same resistance is in this lamp. And then the electrons will just continue to flow. Well, there is no resistance in a switch, so the electrons will flow. And then they will meet at the amp meter again. There is almost no resistance in an amp meter, and they will flow back to the battery. Yeah, so that's also an answer to question D. Which meter, a voltmeter or an amp meter, has the highest resistance? A voltmeter always has the highest resistance. An amp meter has almost no resistance. Keep that in mind, boys and girls. Okay, another assignment. Draw the following circuits. For each circuit, you can use the following elements, battery, uh, several switches, and two lamps. The first one, a circuit with two lamps that shine equally bright and can be switched simultaneously on and off with one switch. Question B, a circuit with two lamps that shine equally bright, each lamp can be individually switched on and off. And question C, a circuit with two lamps that shine equally bright, each lamp can be individually switched on and off, and with one extra switch you can simultaneously switch both lamps off. Or on, of course. Well, put the movie on pause and make sure that you do this question in your notebook. Okay, let's take a look at the first one. Well, the first one is not that difficult. It's just a standard circuit with two lamps that are in series with each other. So all the electrons flow to this lamp and then to that lamp. To the uh, well, the switch is in this case open, but you could have drawn that as a closed switch and then it will flow back to the negative pole. Then question B. Well, in this case, you can switch off each lamp individually. So if you close this switch, then the electrons will flow this way and back to the battery. If you also close this switch, then part of the electrons will go that way and a part of the electrons will go that way. If the resistance of those two uh, light bulbs is exactly the same, then the same amount of electrons will flow over here as over here, namely half of the total. So then the electrons will come together over here, sorry, over here, and they will flow back to the battery as the total current. Then question number C should look like this. As some students maybe place this uh, switch on the other side. That's no problem. That's the same. With this switch, you can switch everything on and off. If you close this switch and you close this one, then this one will be shining and this won't be shining. Next question. Different circuits are given. I will show you another one in the next slide. In each circuit, fill in the value that should be given on the different multimeters. So I give you a tip for this one. In this case, every multimeter is actually connected as a voltmeter. So you should uh, figure out what should be the potential difference in this case, in that case, and in that case. I want to tell you this, that the lamps are all the same. They have the same resistance. Well, stop the movie for a minute and try to figure this out. Okay, to start with, the maximum potential difference is, of course, created by the battery. So that is that 9.4, uh, sorry, 9.6 volt. Can't be bigger than this one, wherever you measure it. It's always lower than that 9.6. Well, the first one is an easy one, and that is measuring the potential difference over a wire. Well, if you measure the potential difference over a wire, you will always get a value of zero. 
because there is actually no energy used over here. <coughs> well, the same is over here. The same uh, with uh, a switch. There is no energy used in a switch. There's no energy conversion taking place. So there is also going to be a potential difference of zero. Well, if the light bulbs are equal, that means they will get the same amount of potential difference. So this one got 3.2. Well, what is left from that 9.6? Well, that is of, of course also 3.2 for the left one and 3.2 for the right one. Yeah. So because of the resistance is the same in those light bulbs, uh, uh, the potential difference is also going to be the same in a series circuit. Okay, this question. Uh, but now you need to uh, look at those uh, multimeters again because some of them are switched, uh, sorry, are connected like a voltmeter and some are connected as a, uh, an amp meter. So focus on that and then try to finish this question. Well, in this question, the total potential difference is not given uh, at the battery. But you can calculate that because the total potential difference is, of course, the potential difference yeah, over those different light bulbs added together. Because the potential difference over here, uh, measuring over a wire, will always give you a value of zero. Well, this one is not a uh, voltmeter, it's an amp meter. It's part of the circuit, so it will measure the current flowing through that circuit. Well, if you measure the current over here, 1.3 amps, it will be the same over here, 1.3 amps. Well, the volt meter over here gives you a difference of zero because there is no energy used in a wire. And that means that the potential difference, the total potential difference is, of course, the sum of all those potential differences together. So 4.3.4 4 plus 4.3 plus 2.1, well, plus zero gives you an outcome of 10.0 volt. Well, I already told you that the current should be the same as the current over here. So it's going to be 1.3 amps. Well, this is a, the main law that you should remember after this chapter. This is called the law of conservation of energy. The first law of thermodynamics. I don't think that is correct. So you should get rid of this part. It's not the first law of thermodynamics. The thing that you need to know is energy cannot be created or destroyed. Yeah. Some students think that... Uh, in a, uh, in a wind turbine, you're actually creating energy. You're not creating energy, you're converting energy. You're converting wind energy into electrical energy. But the total amount of energy is already present. So energy can only be transformed. So over here we have an example. In this case, you're holding the hammer. That means there is potential energy. The, ener uh, the hammer wants to drop down. Well, when it starts moving downwards, that is, of course, kinetic energy. So that means that all the potential energy is actually converted in kinetic energy. And when it hits the nail, it's actually converted in mechanical energy, impact energy in this case. So if you start with 100 joule over here, that means you have 100 joule over here and you still have 100 joule over here. Energy is not lost. Energy is only converted from one type to another type. Over here you see the same, you have potential difference over here, and when it's released, it's kinetic energy. So 100% of the potential energy is converted in kinetic energy. Actually not 100%, there's always a bit of waste in the form of heat. So what is resistance? Well, we already talked about resistance. Resistance, of course, well, uh, uh, well the resistance of the flow of those electrons. Well, and if there is a lot of resistance, you get a lot of heat. So in this case, there was energy conversion, electrical energy to heat energy. So the resistance is something that you can measure in a wire as well. And this is only um, part of the content for VWO. So if you're half a class, you can skip this part. The resistance of a wire is something that you can calculate, and it depends on a few things. Uh, and the formula is given over here. So the resistance equals the resistivity, and that is just a property of the material. Yeah. 
So if you take, for instance, copper, it has a certain resistivity. If you take glass, you make this wire of glass, you have a different resistivity. If you take paper, again, different resistivity. So this is really a property of the material. Well, the resistance of this wire depends on the length of this wire. So you can make it longer or shorter. And it depends on the cross-section of this wire. Yeah, if this, this cross-section can be bigger or it can be smaller. And that, well, influences the resistance. Well, how to deal with this formula? The resistivity is something that will always be given, and that is going to be given in uh, ohm meters. That is a standard unit. The standard unit of length is, of course, meters, and the standard unit for the cross section is, of course, squared meters. Well, you see over here, meters multiplied by meters, and then you divide it by meters squared, you will get the unit ohms for resistance. So this formula can be written in symbols, and you get something like this. Capital R is rho multiplied by capital L divided by A. This is a formula that you should be able to apply in the upcoming test. Well, let's talk about that formula in the form of uh, an example. Oh, and over here I also pointed out some important things. Again, this is a property of the material. And remember, this is the surface area, the cross section. Yeah, And the formula for that was... Uh, P multiplied by R squared. So if you know R, you take R squared multiplied by pi, and then you have this cross section. Okay, last question is this question. When the resistivity and the cross section stay constant, but you, uh, you use a wire that is twice as long, well, then the resistance will be twice as big or twice as small. Please stop the movie and finish this question yourself. Well, the, uh, the resistance will be twice as big, of course, because the length was on top, uh, was above this line over here. Everything that is above this line, if you make this bigger, this one gets bigger. Well, there's already an answer to the second one. Try to formulate the answer yourself. But the answer should be smaller, of course. If something is over here, under this line, if you make this bigger, this one gets smaller. That's the idea. So the relationship between the resistance and the length, we call that direct proportional, double the length. The resistance will be doubled, and we call this inversely proportional between the cross-section and the resistance. If you double the cross-section, the resistance will be divided by two. Last question is, calculate the resistance of a wire with a resistivity of 3.0 ohms meter a length of 2 meter and a cross section of 0 0.2 centimeter squared. Well, please put the video on pause again and try to finish this yourself. Well, the main thing in this question is uh, you need to convert everything to standard units. The cross section of 0 0.5 squared meters, uh, sorry, squared centimeters it should be, is of course not a standard unit, so you should convert this into squared meters. So remember, this should be squared centimeters. So, convert it into squared meters, you just multiply by 10 to the power of minus 4. Now you can just fill it in, and you get an outcome of 12 ohms. Hopefully everything was clear for you in this presentation. If there are any questions, you can ask me at the next lesson, of course. Hopefully you're prepared for the next quiz. Uh, thumbs up if you like this movie. Of course, make sure you subscri subscribe to my channel. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.